a great couple of days, right? And uh, I am here uh, right now representing my other hat. So uh, most of you already know that I'm executive director of the Creative Coast, who put on Geekend. Um, my other hat is that I am uh, with CETA, the Savannah Economic Development Authority. There's a few of them in the room. And I am vice president of innovation and entrepreneurship. And um, while my job at the Creative Coast is about, um, I would call it economic gardening, cultivating this creative technology startup community here in Savannah, Georgia, by helping entrepreneurs that are already here scale and grow their companies. My job at CETA is about actually going out into the world and trying to get more great entrepreneurs to move here and grow and scale businesses here. And also work with the companies, larger companies that are already in the area and help them innovate. Hence, VP of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And so I am really pleased today to be able to uh, announce our, our final keynote. Um, it was really important to us that we put together a program that touched all sorts of innovators in our city. And that means entrepreneurs, and that means indie gamers, and that means people doing interesting things in logistics technology, and it means people innovating in the larger corporations as well. Right? And so we wanted to have a, a special program and a um, special speaker, a special keynote that really talked about innovation in the, these larger organizations and how to innovate. So I am uh, very pleased to be the person that gets to introduce our final keynote. Her name is Kath Kutzer. She is the Global Innovation Portfolio Director with Coca-Cola. Her, woo! So Americas love brand, right? Who doesn't love Coke? And think about Coke. I mean, it's, it's been around for probably over 100 years. Way more than 100 years, right? But it continues to innovate, right? It continues to touch our lives and speak to us as a brand. And so I think she's going to give an amazing speech. speech. She's uh, talked to us. She's been with Coke for over 20 years. She is truly a global citizen. Her career spans time serving people in 40 different countries. So she brings a global perspective to how she thinks about things. She is a recent transplant to the United States from South Africa. And she also has one of my key things that we have in passion, passion about is empowering women, right? So I'm the founder of Startup Chicks. She is an advocate for women. She is an advocate for education. <laughs> And, and one of the favorite things that she, I heard her say uh, in a different talk was that life is not a rehearsal, so get to it. Without further ado, Kath Kutzer. So good afternoon, Savannah. So you'll hear from my accent, I'm definitely not American. I apologize in advance. I am from a tiny country at the southernmost tip of the African continent called South Africa. And for those of you who've had the privilege of visiting that country, you'll know it's a really beautiful space. It's diverse. It's a tapestry of cultures. We have 11 official languages. Um, we speak generally quite quickly. So if I'm speaking ahead, put your hand up and go, hey, slow down. It's all good. My family and I have been in the country for all of 15 days. It has been, I'm going to describe it like this, adventure, admin, and aviation. Adventure because it's just new and it's just amazing and people in the south are exactly what, what they say they are, which is warm and friendly. So thank you for that and another example of that hospitality. Admin because I have never filled in as many forms as I have <laughs> in the last 60 days. Who knew that your daughter had to have a four-page form to get on a yellow school bus? That's a whole new learning curve for us. <laughs> and aviation because it really is kind of just dipping in and out and trying to figure out what do we have in common and what is different? And what I'm figuring out, it's really in some of the language and the nomenclature. So the other day I was sitting in a restaurant and I said, may I please have a serviette? Oh. And the lady <laughs> tending to us said, what do you mean? I said, a serviette. She said, well, what is that? And I said, it's that thing that you, you want a napkin? I mean, that's what it is. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> a napkin. And then I was telling a colleague of mine um, on Wednesday this week, I pulled up to the robot. And he looked at me and he said, you have robots in Africa? And I went, yeah, a lot of them. He went, what do they do? I said, they turn red, yellow, and green. He goes, the traffic lights? 
I said the traffic lights. So I'm learning 15 days in that there are things that we use different terms for. So if I say anything that doesn't make sense, just go, hey, what is that in American language? <laughs> so it's a real honor to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. I thought I'll do something a little bit different. I'm not going to lecture you on innovation. There are so many innovation minds sitting in this room. I've read the bios of everybody who spoke here. I've been so impressed by some of the stories that I've heard about and read about that I thought I'll just tell you a little story about a company that started somewhere really, really small and try and draw some parallels between what you guys may be thinking about and working on and this big enterprise that we now call Coca-Cola. So if that's okay with you, I'd like to get straight to that. So in 1886, a pharmacist by the name of John Pemberton developed a brown soda fountain drink with, with bubbles. Sold that in a little pharmacy in at downtown Atlanta. He charged five cents a glass for that cold drink. And everyone who, who tried it absolutely loved it. Sales were great back then. He sold nine whole glasses a day. <laughs> little did he know that in 1987, his bookkeeper sat down to do a little bit of design work, put together a name, put together the logo, and he could hardly have known that a century and a bit later, that would be as iconic today as it was back then. Who would have imagined? That cursive typeset we call Spencerian script is very proudly protected by everybody that sells and serves Coca-Cola around the world, and we'll talk a little bit about that. He sold that business for the tidy sum of $1 to another pharmacist called Asa Candler in the early 1890s. And the business grew tenfold. So much so that he sold his pharmacy. And together with his brother John, they established the Coca-Cola Company. And they patented the trademark in around 1896. Little did Pemberton know that in 1899, that drink would be sold in glass bottles and that they would start licensing bottling, independent bottling operations to sell that beverage around the world and across many states in the USA. And so was birthed what I think is probably one of the oldest franchise models then and still around today. We don't do business without our bottling partners. It really is a partnership model. Little did Pemberton know that in 1919 the business would again be sold, this time for a very tidy sum of $25 million to a group of investors led by a banker by the name of Ernest Woodruff. Ernest's son Robert, in this picture, would go on to lead the company for 60 years, six decades. I don't know of another CEO who has led a corporation this size for that length of time. And you'd imagine that the corporation would get tired, but it didn't. Little did Pemberton know that Robert Woodruff was so passionate about this brand that he would expand operations to 24 countries with those bottling partners. Little did Pemberton know that 30 years after he concocted that wonderful drink, the contour bottle would be introduced and would make the brand and the drink instantly recognizable amongst any of the other beverages sold in the day. Little did Pemberton know that during the Second World War, they would advance those operations to the Pacific, to Europe, and across Africa. And by the end of World War II, five billion bottles of cold drink of Coca-Cola would be consumed. Five billion. Little did Pemberton know that by the 1960s, Coca-Cola would go on to introduce other flavors like Fanta and Sprite, very well-loved brands around the world and that by 1985 they would extend the Coke franchise into Diet Coke with great and enthusiastic response from consumers. And I have to say, wherever I go, I always listen for what people are ordering. And nine times out of ten, when it's a Coke they're ordering, I'm hearing them say Diet Coke or Coke Zero. And everyone has a very particular preference for one versus the other. So this has been an amazing evolution in our portfolio. Little did Pemberton know that we would go on to develop a portfolio of brands across very many beverage categories, including juice, waters, iced teas, energy drinks, dairy brands. And why did we do that? Because the consumer keeps changing. The consumer is a fickle creature. The consumer creates new demands and has different expectations day in, day out. And so the portfolio approach is the way that we make sure we stay current, but most importantly, that we offer choice, so that every time someone reaches for a drink, 
hopefully it's something that they reach for from our portfolio. We talk in the business about within arm's reach, and very recently we talk about within the click of reach, given the, the advent of the digital environment. So we're very proud of the portfolio that we've built and are building around the world. Little did Pemberton know that what started out as a very humble beverage would expand today to over 450 brands around 204 countries. That we've such an expansive enterprise, employing thousands of people around the world, creating love and the enjoyment of refreshment through brands like Coca-Cola. Little did Pemberton know that today, right here in Savannah, in this wonderful crowd of people, we'd be telling the story of Coca-Cola yet again, 133 years after the first person drank the first glass of Coca-Cola. As I said, my name is Kath. I'm a huge advocate for the Coca-Cola company and for the brand because I believe in what the brand stands for. And innovation does many things. It can change your brand radically overnight. But I do believe at the heart of every brand positioning and the work you do in your innovation portfolio, you need to hold on to what your DNA is. And that's, what I, and that's why I've stayed for 20 years at Coca-Cola, because I love the people and because I love what we stand for. You may know this quote. It's one of my favorites about Coca-Cola by the great artist, producer, and creative lead of the visual arts movement known as pop art, Mr. Andy Warhol, who said, you can be watching TV and seeing a Coca-Cola ad, and you know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and just think you can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke, no amount of money can get a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it, the president knows it, the bum knows it, and you know it. And this is possibly the love relationship I have with this brand, is a Coke is a Coke. You cannot buy a better Coke. It is magical and the same everywhere around the world. He also said, and this is my favorite business quote by him, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. And I think it is this best art that brought you all to Geek End 2019. It is this idea of great art and business that is at the core of what many of the conversations have been about and what I'm sure many of the great speakers referenced when they shared their experiences and their insights. I will tell you this. There's a lot of lore about the secret formula. Does anybody know what the secret formula is? There's, there's lavish gifts waiting if you can guess what the secret formula is. <laughs> I will share with you that there genuinely are only two people in the world who know what the formula is. But I will also tell you this, and this is my fundamental personal belief, that the real secret formula of Coca-Cola is this magical thing called belief. Belief that you can take something from such humble origins and you can grow it through the power of people their passion and their commitment to something that is such an expansive enterprise in the world today. I believe that belief is at the core of what brought you here. This is why you've spent and invested your time in Geek End over the last couple of days. It is belief that has created millions of Coke stories around the world. And the anthropologist in me wishes I had time to hear every one of the Coke stories that I'm sure many of you have. I love hearing about the time that people first found Coke when they first decided that they loved Coke. And of course, in America, these are amplified stories because we've got fantastic, I call them partners, some people call them competitors, but the boys in blue down the road, very good for business. There is nothing like a catalyst to action when you have someone else in the same sector as you. I would love to hear your Coke stories. So if you'd like to share it, I would love to leave my email address, and please do share them with me. I'm trying to collect stories of Coke and Coke, um, finding Coke moments around the world. You came to Geek End this weekend because you believe strongly in ideas. You believe in shared experiences. It is your belief that grit, grind, and guts help you stay the course as you search for success. It is your belief that the collisions of minds and creative talent might seed the germ of an idea that takes you to the next level of success. It is the idea of belief. It is the capability of belief that I, un that I believe underpins every successful business. 
The 21st century consumer is an interesting creature, and I'm sure you've spoken about um, this consumer very often over the last couple of days. Winning with the 21st century consumer, in my mind, really is this balancing trick between art and science. Science is the acquiring of knowledge through data, and I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations about data over the last two days. Anyone in business knows that data is the new currency. In fact, I heard the CEO of a company called Keller Williams here in the US refer to data as the new oil the other day. And I think he's spot on. I really do think he's right. Art is taking that knowledge and applying it through innovation in such a way that your services, your products, your brands are adopted by consumers and integrated into their everyday lives. That is the indication of success when they don't see their lives operating without the service or the product or the brand that you have to offer. That belief, that art and science, has seen us grow a business around the world with something we now call a vision of a total beverage business. We want to be the company that has the right drink for everyone across any drinking moment, across any drinking occasion. And we've moved. There was a time where in our company, if you didn't say Coca-Cola was your favorite drink, you'd be frowned upon. Today it's different. It's quite okay to say my favorite drink is a water. You'll see I drink Dasani water. My favorite drink is Gold Peak Tea. My favorite drink is a brand we launched three months ago in South Africa called Micheo. It's a plant-based drink, very thick and viscous in its consistency, but acts like a meal replacement. And so it is that belief that propels our business forward. It is that belief that sees hundreds of thousands of people go out into the market every day and do the business of Coca-Cola. It is that same belief that drives our appetite for innovation, that sees us sitting down just like you guys do, I'm sure, and think about what's the next best beverage we can bring to market. Do we win every time? Heck no. Do we have a lot of failure? Heck yes. We throw a lot of stuff at the wall and we wait to see what sticks. But that's the beauty, that's the license to innovate, is the right to try something, if it doesn't work, pull it back and try again. That's when I think you've, you've gotten into the DNA of innovation. Failing forward, failing fast, being agile. All the while protecting the specialness of Coke. When it comes back to it, we hold most proudly our origins. And I don't know if you've heard this statement. We use it often in our business. We say, we have the privilege of standing on the shoulders of giants. Have you heard that, that saying? And Pemberton was a giant. He just didn't know it. He had no idea that that simple drink would become something as profoundly huge around the world. Our CEO, James Quincy, was in a conversation with us about three weeks ago, and he said, he was chatting to a very successful businessman who said, people will tell you, seeing is believing. He says, that's last century. The 21st century is all about believing is seeing. And I don't believe any startup, any innovation hub, anybody who takes any time to put an idea together to try something out in the world of consumers is not propelled by this very mantra, believing is seeing. I think it is belief that brought you here, belief that you can connect those ideas, belief that you can share those experiences, belief that you can be in the company of other people who think creatively like you do, belief that you can sit with people and go, how do I bring the art and science together, belief that we can fail forward and we can fail fast, belief that you can build the capabilities for success, belief.
So my simple message today is, I can spend a lot of time talking to you about innovation, the theory of innovation, which I'm sure all of you know. But I would rather leave you with this thought, that at the end of all, it really is about the capability of belief. Don't stop believing. Never let self-limiting beliefs get in the way of your idea, in the way of your success. Get up every morning and fervently, passionately believe that what you've set your sights on, you will achieve. It's been a real honor to spend time with you today. I'd like to hear more about you. I want to leave some time just to take some questions, if you will. But to thank you for your time and to wish you an abundance of everything that drives and motivates you every single day. Please share your success stories with me. I love the startups. I love the entrepreneurs. I love everything people do in the space of thinking and bringing that art and science together. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Any questions? I've drank plenty of your energy drinks, but um, recently I've tried a brand called Celsius. Mm -hmm. And Celsius has a flavor called cola. And it made me start thinking about Coca-Cola. I'm wondering why you haven't thought about the idea of taking your regular Coca-Cola and creating an energy drink from the regular Coke. Is the term NDA known to all of you? <laughs> <laughs> I shall answer you, ma'am, by saying the following. A, very astute. B, watch this space. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, cool. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is, uh, what is your favorite Coca-Cola ad campaign and why do you like it? Um, there's an archive in the building at the Atlanta office, uh, office complex where you can literally see every piece of copy that was ever developed. But my favorite one comes from Africa. It actually comes from Morocco. And it's built on this insight that sibling bonds can be tremendously powerful when you need them to be. And the story plays out in the park, you may have seen it, where a young boy is being bullied by some other kids of his age. And he's drinking a Coca-Cola, and one of these bullies walks across and rips the Coke from his hand. And as he turns around to walk away, he runs into this young boy's bigger brother, who sorts him out there and then. And it's probably the one advert that brought tears to my eyes. Now, it may be driven by the fact that I have sons myself and really resonates with me, and I get that. But it was just, for me, what is beautiful about advertising is when it really just clicks on a deep human insight and connection. And that particular advert would have to take the cake, I'd say. There will be many beautiful ones. You know, I love Hilltop. It's iconic. It's, it's, it's you know, everybody talks about the Hilltop ad. Um, but I would probably say that one for sure. For sure. So you had a question up there. Oh, I have a question. Sorry, I have the mic already. Hi. Um, is loud. Uh, what opportunity or what does the conversation end up being like when somebody tells you their favorite soda is Pepsi? Is a Pepsi brand? I what does that conversation love end up those being? Conversations. <laughs> I love them. So first of all, um, it would be remiss not to acknowledge that competition is very good for your business. Competition gives you reason to propel forward and fuels your desire behind success. But I will tell you this that the Pepsi conversation, certainly in, in conversations I've been exposed to, is one of great respect. It's a company that's built on very similar ideals and values to ours. They do very good business around the world. And I always tell my teams, you respect your competitors. They're doing something right too, and you can often learn from them. Having said that, Pepsi has a different footprint around the world. The country I come from, they have a 3% market share, whereas in a country like America, it seems like it's a kind of a two-horse race, right? Am I right? That's my assumption about 13, 14 days in. So relative to market share, you will come at the market with a strategy that reflects what your goals and ideals are relative to growth and market share gain. But as it relates to the conversation about Pepsi, I love them. I think they're a fantastic organization. I was so impressed by their previous CEO. And if you haven't read her farewell note to her employees, I would urge you, take the time to read that. It's highly inspirational. 
and it gets at the core of all things business, which is lift your head just long enough to know, which is what I say, life is not a rehearsal. Don't get so sucked into what you're doing that you miss out on this wonderful thing called life. Uh, Coca-Cola is also known for one of the lar largest marketing failures in history. In the 1980s, they introduced a product called the New Coke. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from that innovation? Well, but I was at school back then, so um, I have. St it was not my fault. Thank you. That's the response I was looking for. That's the response I was looking for. I will tell you, it's a great case study. It's a great, great case study for marketers and innovators in. As you advance your innovation agenda, be sure to understand what is working and don't fiddle with it. <laughs> Figure out ways to complement it, to bring new fresh ideas and uh, find new ways of connection, but do not mess with what works. And in the Coca-Cola company, we love that story because it keeps us, it's a true north for us. It's every time we do a piece of innovation, I'll say to the team, what is the impact of this innovation going to be? Are you going to take away? Or are you going to add? If you're taking away, we're not doing it. It's as simple as that. We launch eight brands every day around the world. And that's a true north for us. If it's diluting value somewhere, if it's cannibalizing, do not do it. Do not do it. So it's a great case study. I believe it's still taught in, in business schools around the world. Yep. Yeah? Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, again, thanks for coming. This has been, this has been very interesting. Um, really impressive. Uh, two questions, maybe uh, two more challenging ones. The, uh, um, as, as consumers uh, have more, uh, have, I guess, more education around health conscious choices um, and also environmentally conscious choices, how is Coca-Cola working with that? Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd also like to uh, really press on the second aspect of that is the environmental one, because it seems that different brands are sort of, you know, the consumer is a fickle one, um, and we're definitely sort of going maybe away from the more the sugary drinks to different types of drinks, but drinks are still delivered in a, in a thing. And how does that thing, um, what is Coca-Cola doing? And how are you, I guess, talking about that? What's the story around that? So let me ask the first one, um, which really at the heart of it alludes to sugar, right? And the story there is we decided about seven, eight years ago that the smart consumer thing to do would be to provide choice. And there were many conversations of what choice might look like. Might it be Coke without a sugar? Might it be something that's not a Coke? And very quickly we realized after doing huge amounts of qualitative and quantitative research that really what you want to do is you want to give the consumer the right to decide for themselves. They want to be able to walk up to the coal bank and go, today I want Coke original. Today I feel like a Coke with less calories. Today I feel like Coke with a flavor. Today I feel like Coke with zero calories. And the minute you take away the right to choose is when the brand gets into a difficult space. And so our strategy very explicitly has been about choice. And I love that. I love that because I think every consumer has the right to choose what they digest, what they intake every single day. Notwithstanding, we're doing a lot of work around understanding how do we make sure that we bring more functional benefits to our beverages. That's why we have done work in water. That's why we've done work in juice. That's why we do work in dairy and multiple other segments and categories. So we'd like to present to the world a portfolio that allows you to choose the right beverage for you at the moment that you want to consume it for the reasons you want to consume it. Second part of your question. We take our role as responsible corporate citizens very, very seriously. Do I believe we have work to do? Yes. Do I believe we're doing that work? Yes. Do I believe we've finished that work? Not by a long shot. And so whether you're having conversations around biodegradability, recycling, creating an ecosystem around recycling, and the use of plastics, this is core to the business and the conversation and narrative every single day. I think the magic is when industry gets together and says, how do we put the power of one and one such that three is the outcome? And we are the very first people to admit that we derive value and benefit from the societies and the communities in which we do our business. And if we don't hold ourselves to that responsibility, we shouldn't be in business. That answer the question? Yeah. Pleasure. My, my uh, question has to do with a uh, machine that's popped up over the last few years in this region, a Coca-Cola freestyle machine. Yes. And in particular, I wanted to know if the story I heard was true, that mm -hmm. the, the Coca-Cola partnered with uh, the inventor of the Segway 
to create those machines. Dean uh, Kamen, I can't think of his name now, but, but it, the, my understanding was he, he agreed to design those machines if Coca-Cola agreed to produce water quality machines that help purify. And I wondered whether or not that's Coca-Cola's take on that and whether or not those machines have populated uh, throughout the world. So the simple answer is I really don't know. Um, I would not be surprised, and I'll tell you why. In the team that I've come to work in now, we have an external technology acquisition platform, which means we do a lot of work with people in the techno space. And so we do derive cues and insights from people working in completely different tech industries to ours. The freestyle machine really comes from a space and a strategy around personalization. We had a lot of feedback from consumers, which went something along the lines of, I love the beverage, but can I fiddle with it a little myself? Can I add a little bit of this, a little bit of that? And so that's what the freestyle machine seeks to do. Personalization is going to guide the way of all brands and services in the next 30 years. And freestyle was our first attempt at doing that. There's a lot of work we're doing in that space. So I would certainly like to go and find out if that story is true, because that's a beautiful story if it is, right? Yeah, I'll definitely go and find out. It would not surprise me, because we talk to a lot of people, and it would surprise you, the people we talk to in the industries we converse with. Very broad range of industries, completely outside of the beverage space, because people are thinking about these things, delivery systems, personalization, convenience, and the likes. I wanted to... Um, hi. I wanted to follow up with his question because I was a student at Savannah State when we started a recycling program and you actually, Coca-Cola has grant funding to help start recycling programs at um, local communities and for events, which extends to campuses. In an environment where you're not there yet with the sustainable products, but they're coming, what would you say to a city like Savannah to take initiative to work with a Georgia-based company like Coca-Cola to help offset um, for those challenges? How, how do you get power in a Savannah to say, hey, where can, what can we do to build this relationship, this collaboration with Coca-Cola to do that? And I know that was a big question, but, uh, you know. That's a great question. Yeah. So the way I always answer questions like that is in, in every area around the world, you have a local, we have a local Coca-Cola bottling partner. So you have a bottling partner here that provided the product here today. And so if there's nothing going on in this space, the first call I would make would be to the local bottling partner because they in turn work with us. So we are headquartered in Atlanta and we have a um, number of HQs around the world. But I would start there because ultimately that's where the magic happens. It's through the efforts of the guys on the ground that are doing the distribution, doing the sales, and who can do the recycling efforts through the platform of our reach and that scale, that I think that's where the conversation needs to start. And if, if, it's, not a, if it's not a successful conversation, then absolutely reach out to the Coca-Cola company based in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. You said um, in your presentation, I believe you said, fail forward and fail fast. Yes. In a global company like Coca-Cola, I would think you have many more resources to recover what, what advice would you give to smaller entrepreneurs? How, what, what, is there a time frame for fail fast? <laughs> when do you make that snap judgment and go, we've, we've messed up, we need to pivot? So if I knew the answer to that, I would have written a, a <laughs> best-selling <laughs> novel. Um, I'll tell you this. I acknowledge that I work in an enterprise where we have a lot more dollars to do the kind of exploratory work that we do to understand where things stick. But I think ultimately, my view on strategy is strategy is just choice. It's understanding what the options are, picking the one that you think has the highest likelihood of success, and monitoring it. I think the thing I've learned most in my innovation roles is people will throw things at the market, and then they'll walk away because life carries on. I think when it's in the market, that's when you start to watch, and you watch closely for the first 30 days. You watch even more closely for the next 30 days. And by end of 90 days, you should have an informed point of view on the traction or lack of traction of what you're trying to do in the marketplace. And then you take some decisions. You either pivot in a different direction or you pull it out. I think a lot of the dollars are wasted because we take too long to react to that which is not working. And we don't connect them strongly <laughs> enough to the very consumer insight we were leveraging when we went to market with the idea, the brand, the service, the product, whatever the case may be. So I think a lot of it is just the discipline of post-launch review and post-launch monitoring. 
to help. Yes, uh, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway are savvy investors in Coca-Cola, have been for decades. Mm -hmm. Mr. Buffett is quoted as saying, if you gave me $100 billion and said to take away the soft drink leadership of Coca-Cola in the world, I'd give it back to you and say it can't be done. In your opinion, how does Coca-Cola maintain that leadership in the world? Obviously, having 450 brands is a huge portfolio to maintain. What are some of the challenges you see in maintaining that leadership? That's a great question. So our leadership position looks very different relative to which country you're looking at. But I will tell you this, that is common across the company, and that's why I spoke about the capability of belief. Every day we get up and every day we go to market to fight for one more point of share. Where the conversation has changed is we used to talk about volume share. We no longer talk about volume share, we talk about value share. And value share is value to the consumer, value to the customers, the, the, the shopping environments and where we do our business every day, value to the environment, and value to multiple stakeholders. So it's a tough battle. I've seen many people come and go at Coke. Um, at the face of it, it's a fairly simplistic business. It's beverages. You throw them down your throat and you move on. But behind that simplicity is a battle hard fought every single day. We make sure that every one of our employees are, are connected to strong metrics that have got to do with value share gain, value share protection. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we don't. But I think that belief is what keeps bringing us back and nothing motivates a team more than a goal like I would love us to celebrate a three value share point gain by the end of this year. Let's see if we can go do that. And in fact, from where I come from, they use the go KYA. And I'm sure that's familiar to you guys. Go kick ass. Okay. Every single day, go out there and do what you do best. So we are never complacent. We are never complacent. Um, and our previous CEO coined a beautiful term, and now I'm going to forget it because I wanted to tell you it. I think he called it... Discomfort... I think he said it was uncomfortable leadership. Something like that. But something that goes, never for one moment assume arrogance, never for one moment be complacent, never for one moment take your eye off the ball. The consumer... The consumer decides every single day. I'd love an hour with Warren Buffett, by the way. <laughs> I would love an hour to pick that brain. He is phenomenal. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Hi. Welcome. Welcome to Thank America. Uh, what would you say to, as head of the innovation portfolio, what would you say to this organization of collective entrepreneurial and creative minds uh, to get some sort of attachment or um, uh, eyeballs from their products and services to enterprise grade companies and clients like Coca-Cola? As an accessibility? Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of forums where certainly um, corporations like Coke are starting to do work with a lot of startups. Um, the role I came from in South Africa, we set up a team where all we did every day was go out and talk to startups, talk to entrepreneurs, go, what are you guys working on? How do we partner? How do we learn from each other? So um, I would say a big, a big push for me would be this thing called collaboration, which people use very loosely. But for me, real collaboration is getting into the room, taking the time out from your corporate activities, working with great minds like people in this room and go, is there something we could do together? If we can't do it together, can we at least learn from each other? Um, I like to use the example of the pharmaceutical industry. I like to use the example of beauty care industry. You know, they do things that are arguably very, very disassociated with the work that I do. But they're doing work that leaves us so many clues. And I love that statement about life leaves you clues. But life leaves you clues when you're having collisions and when you're having conversations. So if you're a small startup, if you're someone with an idea, I would find out in the corporate environment around you who is doing what we call VEB work, venturing and emerging business. Because any smart enterprise today is having those conversations for the benefit of all stakeholders. Hi, again. Do I need a mic, really? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do it. 
So you're saying that you're collecting Coke stories. I would be curious what your Coke story is or some favorites that you've collected. I'll tell you mine first. So I think I was five years old and my mom used to send us to the local corner grocery store to buy bread and milk. Um, and there was never money for Coke. And I always wondered why she never asked me to buy Coca-Cola, but I'd see people reaching into the cooler and, and, and buying the cold drink. And I came home one night and I said to her, how come you never tell us to buy Coke? And she said, well, right now, there isn't money to buy Coke. It's bread and milk. So I went, okay, so Coca-Cola must be for really rich people. And then my father said, hang on a second. It's just we've never thought about it. And so he went up to the same store and he bought, I'll never forget, a glass one litre bottle of Coke. And he came home and he poured us each a glass. And I don't know for you, but that was a magical moment for me. I mean, you have the same moments with Pepsi if you come from Pepsi country. But it was a magical moment for me, and I discovered the, the love of the brand and the love of the product. And then life continued. I went to college. I landed up becoming a lecturer. And uh, one day I was delivering a, an address, and I spotted a man at the back of the room who kept looking like he was scowling at me. And he kept catching my attention because I was like, why is he frowning the whole time? And the next day he called me and he said to me, I'd like to offer you a job. And I said, really, where? And he said, at the Coca-Cola company. I went, no, thank you. And he went, what do you mean, no, thank you? Everyone says yes. I said, no, well, I love what I do. And he says, I'm going to give you a couple of days to think about it. I really think you should come and try something different. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? What have I got to lose? You know, life's an adventure, life's not a rehearsal, let's go do this. And that's literally how I fell into Coke. And I love that story because for startups, and people doing new work, I always say, never say no to opportunity because you never know what it's going to bring you, right? So that's my personal story of Coke. I've been around for 20 years. They'll kick, they'll, they will literally drag me out kicking and screaming before I leave this enterprise. I love it so much. Some of my personal stories have been the stories through the work that the Coca-Cola Foundation does, whether it's in water stewardship, whether it's in female empowerment. I worked in a business unit where we had a goal to empower um, 5 million women by the year 2020, all through the value and supply chain. Um, I don't know that we're going to hit 5 million people by next year, but the number is looking close to 2.8 as we stand right now. And then there's the multiplier effect. So for every woman you empower in the communities in Africa, they take their families and their extended families in the community with them. So those are the stories I love. But I do love the stories of discovery of Coke on a very personal level. So I'd single out those two. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you for joining us. Um, your program says that we're going to, is this working still? All right, cool. I guess I'm too loud. So um, your program says that we have a special announcement, um, and that's what I'm doing now. So. <laughs> I haven't told you what it is yet. <laughs> so this weekend, we've learned from one another about how we can do now better. We've connected with new friends and reconnected with old friends. We've seen the world from a new perspective, We've been reminded that we're capable of the extraordinary. We've done these things, and we've done them together. For the past 10 years, we've been geeks, and we've worn the label with pride. Some of us have been geeks for a very long time. We have niche interests that we study to the point of obsession. We're early, sometimes unfashionably early, adopters. We imagine and believe in the world that we want to live in. We are awesome. And that, of course, is the thing about geeks. When geeks grow up, they become something else. They become movers and shakers, the havers of ideas, the executors of plans. On this, the 10th anniversary of Geek End, we want to recognize everybody who's worked hard over the years to make this event successful. So if you, this year or any other year, have been involved in organizing Geek End, please stand up and be recognized right now. A 
Amazing, thank you. So I especially want to recognize my colleague, Jim Bonet, who, uh, for her vital role in raising money so that we could have resources to have this event, among the many other ways that she contributed. Thank you, Jen, for going out there and like getting people invested in this event. And this year's volunteer executive team, we said it before, Geek End is volunteer run. Um, and this event would not be possible without these people. So I believe most of them are in this room right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna recognize them. Uh, Nipuma Bampola, where is he? There he is. He was wrangling volunteers. He's ex executive director of an organization called I Volunteer International. If you need volunteers for an event, you will want to speak to him. They also have an app that's launching in January. So uh, you may wish to check that out at that time. Bethany Armstrong. She is the design genius, uh, brand genius. All of the visuals you've seen at this event are her brainchild. She is amazing. Uh, Brian Canada and Malcolm Howard, who ran the arcade and made it happen. Where are they? <laughs> All right. Um, Clinton Edminster who chaired the Geek End Scholars Program and helped out in countless other ways. I can't even list them all, so thank you, Clinton. Uh, Janie Gray, so Janie rules. Janie uh, coordinated this event. She show ran this whole time. She has been working so hard and I'm, I'm ugh. I'm tearing up. I feel so privileged to have, been, to have worked with you on this event. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> uh, likewise, Rosie Keeley, uh, also a showrunner, amazing coordinator. She's awesome as well. And finally, last but not least, Lori Zipperer, who organized the after party and social events, which we're going to enjoy later tonight. Uh, really, thank you all for your, your selflessness, um, your expertise and everything that you've given to this event, like this would not have happened without. <laughs> so we've been saying that we have something to share with you. And indeed we do. So just as the identity of geeks has changed over time, so has Geek End. Uh, as this event has grown, Geek End has become something else. The combined executive teams from 2018 and 2019 have been working on this process for the better part of the time since last year's Geek End to discover Geek End's next phase. And we're very excited to share that with you now through the words of the former director of the Creative Coast, Blake Ellis. In Savannah, you are literally the environment. It's not a place that normally people wander through. You come here on purpose. I mean, in a world where you can work from anywhere, why not work from somewhere beautiful? Whether it's downtown on Packers Walk, where you're enjoying the incredible architecture we have here, or whether you've got a little office on the outskirts of downtown and you're in the Victorian district and you're watching communities kind of redevelop themselves overnight. Maybe you're out on the highlands and your commute involves incredible marshes and all kinds of wildlife. It's really awesome to go to work in a place like this. It's not easy being an entrepreneur to start with. And it's harder to do it when you don't fit the mold or do it the way that you're supposed to do it or the way everybody else does it. You're sort of stacking the deck against yourself by choosing to be off the beaten path, by choosing your quality of life over other criteria that people might have or that investors might suggest to you that you might ought to have. A Savannah entrepreneur is determined, creative, very much a doer. We have big ideas here, but we also do a lot of the implementation work ourselves. Really, it's a, a place for a well-rounded, dynamic person to truly create something, and the community does a good 
good job of making sure that you were held to a high standard. Silicon Valley has money, and Chicago, New York, Atlanta, lots of talent, potential employees. Savannah's got grit. So take note, this is a historic moment. You are bearing witness to Geek End's graduation. In 2020, we'll celebrate innovation in business, technology, and the arts at the first GRIT conference. So in my uh, conversations with a few people who um, have asked who I've shared this information with, they ask what GRIT stands for, and my knee-jerk response is nothing. It's not an acronym, it doesn't stand for, every, for anything, but the real answer is that it stands for everything. GRIT stands for passion and perseverance, endurance, stamina, and fortitude. GRIT is for everyone with a mission to do now better, and that mission means something different to, for each of us. So Blake Ellis is right, Savannah's got grit, but I think we can all agree that we don't have grit because of Savannah. We, the grown-up geeks, could make it work anywhere. Savannah's got grit because of us. <laughs> so we are eager to celebrate Savannah style and have a drink to, with you all. Um, we are headed to service brewing for an after party and we'll leave here a little before six. Uh, prior to that, I want to introduce, is Rachel here from Hargrave Fiber? So I won't introduce her, but I'll say <laughs> that the happy hour immediately following the, this event uh, is sponsored by Hargrave Fiber and I assume they will be around at some point to um, speak with you. Uh, in closing, on behalf of the 2019 executive team, on behalf of the Creative Coast, thank you for sharing this occasion with us, and we're looking forward to seeing what happens next.